So tonight we are talking about decisions. That is what branching is. Um, and, and there's a lot to it. We're starting off with the basic piece of how do you make a decision in Python. That's what if, else, else statements are. They are about learning how to get Python to make a decision. And computers are stupid. And I've probably got a slide on this somewhere. But computers are stupid. People think that I'm crazy when I say that. But a computer can make one of two decisions, true or false. That's it. Every decision, when you write an if statement in Python, the only two answers that it can have are true or false. It's like a light switch. And I'm not talking a dimmer switch. I'm talking a light switch. On, off. That's it. And what we have to do human beings is we have to learn to break up the questions that we would normally ask so that they can be made by a binary machine. That's what a computer is. It's a binary machine. It does one of two things. On, off, true, false, yes, no, however you want to put that. It just does it really, 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 really fast and it does a lot of them at the same time. As programmers, it's our job to learn to structure the question and maybe a set of questions so that we can get a reliable set of answers. So that's what we're going to be doing this week. So this is our first foray into algorithms. What is an algorithm? Basically, an algorithm is just how do you solve a computational problem? A computational problem is our game from week seven. A computational problem could be a large mathematical equation. A computational problem could be how do I calculate the area of a square. All of those are computational problems. They can be small. They can be big. What we have to do as programmers is understand how to break those computational problems, how to break down the problem statement into a series of steps that a computer can understand. And most of the rest of this class is going to be about, at least uh, up through six, is going to really be about how do we deal with algorithms. This week we're doing decisions and branching. Next week we're doing loops, which are making the same decision repeatedly. And five is how do we structure our code so that it is reusable and we have these little functions that do things. Module six is data structures, and data structures really does talk about how to organize our data. Because if we don't understand our data, we can't understand how to write a good algorithm. Data storage is seven, not so much algorithm. And then object oriented on it on module eight is is um, kind of putting it all together. But this week we're talking about decisions and branching. So we have some new keywords. And in this case, the keywords have an order. The keyword if is always the first keyword in a branch, always. And what the word if does with Python is it says it's time to make a decision. Two through n, n can be whatever n is. It could be five, it could be 10, it could be 110, is L if. L if is, it's a concatenation of else and if. So when the if statement doesn't evaluate to true, it's going to drop down to potentially this L if statement, and there could be another one, and there could be another one, and we'll see that in a bit. And what Ellis does is says, okay, I'm going to make another decision. And then finally is else. That is the last in the order of our branches. And basically that just says, when all else fails, do what's here. So there, this is the one of the few times in programming you will see an order in your keywords. And what do I mean by order? 
I mean that if you don't have the word if first, you cannot have elif. You'll just get an error. The same with else. You can't have else without an if. You can have else without an elif, but you can't have else without an if. So all of your branching starts with if. If you're thinking of starting with the word else, you, you need to stop and start with the word if. So we now have these things called relational operators. So for the last two weeks, I've been saying a variable. We know it's a variable because it's on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. And I've said single equal sign on purpose because now we're going to learn about the double equal sign. While the single equal sign is about assignment, it's saying this value, I'm going to stick it into this variable. Relational operators are about determining, determining the relationship between two pieces of data. So a double equal sign says is equivalent to. So you're asking a question. Is one thing equivalent to the other? Uh, an exclamation point before an equal sign is not equivalent. So if you see an exclamation point in front of just about any relational operator, it means not. And then we have less than, less than or equal to, greater than, and greater than or equal to. So those are all the relational operators. And they are used with our branches. They're used with our if statements. So we have some Boolean operators. I know we're throwing a lot of stuff at you tonight. We have and, or, and not. So Boolean operators, and, and we'll show you how to do the, the more complex decisions in a minute, are really used with more complex decisions. You've got lots of different questions, and you're going to line those questions up in a row, and then you're going to tell it how the answers have to relate. So and says, everything has to be true. If everything isn't true, if, if, all, if I've got this list of questions and all of them are not true, then, or if even one of them is false, then the whole thing is false. Or says, hey, I have this big list of questions. And if any one of those questions is true, then the whole thing is true. And then not is just the opposite of the, whatever the operator you have is. So it would be not and or not or. I didn't use the not and and not or a lot, um, even in my Java programming and my other programming, um, because I don't find it that useful. But it is an option if you want to use it. So there are two Boolean values, true and false. That's it. Computer is a binary machine. It has two states, true or false, period. So scope. Scope dictates when code is available to execute and when a variable is available for use. Everything we've done so far has been in the global scope. So we haven't really had to talk about scope. There is another scope that we do have to talk about, and that is the local scope. Because tonight, we are introducing the concept of a local scope. When a, a uh, question evaluates to true, you want to do something. That stuff you're going to do has to be in the local scope of the branch that you have created. So that's just a thought to remember when you're programming, because if you don't indent properly, your scope will not be set up properly, and you will have problems when it comes to your code. You might not have syntax errors, but you could have logic errors. So let's talk about syntax and formatting. I'm going to input a user age. And I now have this new stuff here. I have if user underscore age is less than 18, then I'm going to print 18 or less, else print over 18. So let's break this down and look at the pieces and parts. Okay, first of all, what you see in blue is everything in the global scope. If it is in the global scope, it is available to the entire program for the entire run of the program. 
So user age is in the global scope and you can use it anywhere you want. Um, and the if and the else statements are also in the global scope. So I can use them anywhere they want, anywhere I want. But the two there are two lines that are in the local scope. There's the print 18 or less and the print over 18. So what does this mean? It means that when the user age is less than 18, I will print 18 or less. Other than that, that line of code essentially doesn't exist to Python when it's running. The same with if user age is not greater than 18. So if it's, sorry, if it's not less than 18, if it's greater than 18, then I would print over 18. Over 18 is in the local scope. And these are very simplistic examples. We'll get to some more, um, we'll get to some more complex examples in just a little bit. But I wanted to get you guys thinking about global and local scope. You can always tell a local scope when you don't have a colored graph in front of you <coughs> because of the indentation. You will notice that print 18 or less, print over 18, are both indented from their keyword if or keyword else. That is your way of telling Python that this statement is in the local scope and I don't want you to consider it unless you get to this scope. Because Python has to do something to get into a local scope. It doesn't just happen. In this case, the only way Python can get to the code in the local scope is if user age is less than 18, it can get to one, one local scope, and if not, then it'll get to another local scope. So I just kind of wanted this picture in everybody's head as we start going. Now there's also something, I think it might be in the next slide. Ah, okay, so let's keep going on this one. I have my two keywords. I have if and I have else. If and else say Python, it's time to make a decision. I have my statement. And this statement reads, it's like a true false. When you when you had to take true false quizzes and you could only answer true or false, that's what these are. So you can read this like user age is less than 18, true or false. Now, I don't know what user age is yet because user age is not in a running program. I haven't done my user input but it will evaluate the value in user age. By the way, you, I will say left-hand side and right-hand side. So the left-hand side of this statement is user age. It is comparing to the right-hand side of this statement, which is 18. And the comparing, comparing that it is doing is the less than. And then I have a colon. The colon can be the bane of your existence. You forget that colon and you're always going to get a syntax error. And it may not always be a syntax error that makes sense because Python doesn't know where to stop looking for the end of the sentence, the end of the question. So it'll keep going. And you might get, you might get weird error messages in strange places that have absolutely nothing to do with the if statement. So it's important to know that. Okay, it's only in the local scope if it's indented. A statement is a variable followed by a Boolean operator followed by a variable or value. That is basically what we can call a statement. So I have an if statement. I have word if, and then I have a variable followed by a Boolean operator followed by a, va a variable or a value because it could not, it didn't have to be 18. It could have been a variable name that contained 18. Okay. Um, computers aren't smart, neither are programming languages. All right, Python doesn't speak English. We have to learn to speak Python. And what we're really doing is we're asking true or false questions. So what I ask is, okay, how to ask uh, the question in Python. I apologize, my, what I ask is gone for some reason. So, I think the question was, am I old? 
So I've, I have a test variable. That test variable will be used in the if statement. Okay? The test variable in this case is user age, and it's got to be assigned before it gets to the word if. Without that, Python's not going to know what user age is. And I'll show you that in just a minute when we go in and we look at um, some of the challenges. There are only ever two possible outcomes. I know I've said this. I know I sound like a broken record. But, you know, sometime this weekend when you're ready to rip your hair out over these, remember, it's a true-false question. You can only ask true or you can only ask questions that will get a true or false answer. So in the statement, I'm using the test value. I'm using the value contained in the test variable to ask M to, add, to evaluate against a value or available. In this case, the value is 18. So if I'm less than or equal to 18, I print 18 or less. It only happens when the when user age is less than 18, so the if statement evaluated to true. If, sorry, uh, the else will only happen when the if is, when the if evaluates the false. That's because of a concept called mutual exclusion. If and else, are related. I never want to see 18 or less if I'm 20 years old, ever. Okay? And I never want to see over 18 if I'm 12. So there is a relationship between the if and the else. Assuming that the if branch is activated and you go in and you print 18 or less, the else will never be activated. Not with this, not with that value of user age, and vice versa. So we're going to go look at the flow chart for just a minute. And by the way, you're going to be doing flow charts. If you're doing flow charts, there's lots of different ways to do them, but there's a free tool that the school recommends and I recommend called Lucid Chart. It has all the flow chart symbols. You can download it as an image. It's a Google tool and it's free. If you're wondering how to make a flow chart, go out and look at Lucid Chart. It will it will make your life easier. So, I have my user age. I've got my start. I've got user age equals in input. We know what that is. We've done it for two weeks. Now I have my diamond. The diamond is the symbol, and these symbols are important when you do flow charts. The diamond is the symbol that says I am making a decision. What is the decision? The decision is really a true-false. The decision is user age is less than or equal to 18. You will see an arrow coming out of that diamond with a true and an arrow coming out of that diamond with a false. The arrow coming out with, of the diamond with a true will print 18 or less, and then it's done. The arrow coming out with false represents the else condition. So it's coming out as false, it's going to print over 18, and that's what an else looks like. So if you are dealing with your flow chart for week three and you are concerned about how to make it look like an else in your flow chart, this is what you do. And let's say I put in 21. So 21 is user age. User age is 21 less than or equal to 18, true or false? Well, 21 is not less than or equal to 18, so I'm going to print over 18 and be done. And why I removed that true stuff is because this is what Python will see. It will skip over that if every single time. So if I do one more of these, and I say I'm 10, user age is 10, user age is less than or equal to 18. That is a true statement. So all of the stuff for the, the false goes away, it prints 18 or less, and I'm done. So now, let's look, yes.
Yes, you can use yes or no on your flow charts rather than true or false. I try I, I tried using both a couple of times, and I think students can get confused. And the easiest way for me to describe how to do these questions is a true-false question. So I try and maintain the terminology of true-false throughout the lecture. But yes, you can use yes or no in your flowcharts. That's completely acceptable. So let's go out and look at a little code. So this is what we've just seen. Okay, we have our user age. I just added another line here. We added we have our user age. We have we're gonna check our user age. We're going if it's you know not less than or equal to eighteen, then we're gonna print um over eighteen. If it is less than or equal to eighteen, we're gonna print these two lines. So just to prove it works. Do this uh, 3.22. There we go. So, as we know, I like my debugger. And by the way, I have started the first breakpoint on line 11. I don't need to break on line four. At this point, we know what the the input does. So, I'm going to go to the console. It's just waiting for me to input. I'm going to input 42. So I am stopped on line 11, and we know I'm stopped because of the blue line there. And I'm going to go to frames and variables just so I can see what I have. Why isn't it telling me user age is for? Oh, user age is 42. It's right there. So now I need to make a decision. Now, the nice thing about PyCharm is not only can you mouse over and it will tell you the value of a variable at any point in time, you can also mouse over the Boolean operator and it will tell you the result. So it just it's just one of those nice little features. Now, 42 is not less than or equal to 18. So PyCharm and Python in general, is going to not even recognize lines 12 or 13. And when I step over this line of code, it's going to go directly to line 15, as if it didn't see those, because kind of didn't. And then when I step over, I'm done. So let's look at a few things that you can do for errors here. First of all, this is a syntax error, okay? You'll see all the red squigglies that just came up. If I attempt to run it, I get indentation error expected an indented block. This error tells you exactly what Python wants you to do, okay? Python wants you to indent. So that was great. If, however, I do this, I get a completely different error. I, I get the error at the if statement. And if I try and run it, I get invalid syntax. And it's telling me that else is invalid. Well, I'm looking at this line of code, and there's nothing wrong with line 14. Absolutely nothing. Because that's not the problem. The problem is that I don't have the correct scope on the line above else. Because if and else are related... I can only follow an else from an if block. And this is not in the if block. That 13 is not indented. Line 13 is in the global scope right now. And it shouldn't be. So what do we do? Well, we put it in the local scope of the if statement. And then everything runs just fine. So, and what happens when I forget my colon, I have, this is a nice one because this time Python said invalid syntax. So it's telling you there's something missing and the something missing is the colon. So those are some of the things to look out for when you are programming this. And we'll look at a few others in just a couple of minutes. 
Okay, one more decision maker, L if. So I want to know how long ago is my year? I don't know why I ask a question like that. Input the year. Year is the test variable, okay? Whatever that answer is, it's going to be an integer and it's going to be stored in year. So here's my fast code because you didn't need to watch me type it. If my year is greater than or equal to, 20, to 2101, it's off in the distant future. Of else if, because this is what we're using now, we're using L if, I want a series of related questions. And I, but I only want one answer. So the way these questions are structured is that there will only ever be one answer. So because this also starts because we're, all of these are using the same test variable. That's what makes them related. So year is greater than or equal to 2101. I'm going to print distant future. This is what gives us the ability to have this kind of infinite set of questions. The L if keyword says, okay, the if statement didn't result in a true. But now I want to see if something else results in a true, or, or and then something else, and then something else. I've seen L ifs with hundreds of lines, or not hundreds, probably about 110, uh, when I was working on a compiler a long time ago. So that's what LF does, and it allows us to have a mutually exclusive set of questions all relating to the same test variable or variables. So you're only going to get to the next statement when the previous statement um, evaluated to false. So let's say year is 1801. Well, 1801 is not greater than or equal to 2101, so it's going to drop down to the elif, and the elif is 1801 greater than or equal to 2001. Nope, that's false. It's going to drop down to the next next statement. It's going to say, hey, is year greater than or equal to 1901? Nope. And then we're going to go all the way down to that else because everything was false. So now it's going to say print long ago. Uh, let's go and look at this one. Okay. Actually, we'll do this one. And it's not the middle age flow chart. I don't know why I titled it that. It's the year flow chart. Okay. So we've got our start and we're going to input a year. So now I've got the, all these decisions. I've got three decisions to go. And the first decision is year greater than or equal to 2101. The second decision, is it greater than or 20, 2001 or 1901? So I have three opportunities for true and three opportunities for false. The three opportunities for true will print whatever the the, um, the statement evaluates to. Otherwise, it's going to go over into that what looks like an L. So this is a more complicated flowchart, but it it gives us an idea of why it's mutually exclusive. So if I put in the year 2200, 2200 is greater than... 2102, and this is what Python sees, except for that errant little arrow. It's going to print the distant future. So if I put 2002, sorry about this graph, people. I apologize. Yeah, I really apologize for this graph. I don't know what happened. So we're just going to stop and go to a piece of code. Okay, what's this one? No. Okay, so this is what we were just looking at. 
And I don't know that I need to go over that. No, I don't think I need to go over that. I think we have the concept. If you don't have the concept, let me know, and we'll go back over the Ellis stuff, but, yeah, I want to get on to some of the other stuff. Okay, so Boolean operators, ands and ors. This has to do with the outcome of multiple statements because I can string questions together. And when I string the questions together, I want to know the total answer. But I can't I can only know the total answer if I string my questions together by evaluating each individual one and its answer. So if I have an and, the rules are, are kind of simple, but you can you can just um you can string a lot of stuff together with ands and ors and come up with kind of crazy questions, question sets. So true and true is always true. True and false is always false. True or false is always true. So you have the opposite action between and and or. If I look at what I've got here and I have these compound questions. My first statement is, if num is the same as 10, is it num, is equi num 1 is equivalent to 10 and num 2 is equivalent to 2, then I'm going to do something. So here's how Python does this. It goes out and it says, okay, is num 1 the same as 10? Yes, num 1 is the same as 10 because there's a variable that's set up there. And then it ignores what's in the middle and says, is num2 the same as 2? Well, yes, it is. And what's in the middle is and. So true and true is true, so I'm going to print got it. Now, if I look at the next statement, it says if num1 is equivalent to 10 and num2 is less than or 2, then I'm going to print nope. Well, num1 is 10. Don't look at the and just yet. Num2 less than or equal to 2 is false. So I have a true and I have a false. With the and word in the middle, it comes out as false. It, it evaluates the false, so it will not print out nope. If I look at or with the same, the same if statement, the only thing I changed was and to an or, I say num1, is equivalent to 10, that's true, or num2 is less than 2. Well, num2 is not less than 2. However, because num1, the state with num1 is equivalent to 10, it, because that evaluated to true, and there's only an or there, the whole thing evaluates to true. So I would print, got it. Or actually, I would print, nope, my bad. So that's that's what Boolean operators do. They allow us to string questions together into a complex set of questions. And you can get really complex in your question sets. I, I, I do sometimes just because of the complexity of the data that I work with. Okay, so we have to deal with the concept of between. And between is, between deals with our Boolean operators and the concept of the mutual exclusion, mutually exclusive question sets. So, and I'm doing this because you're going to have to do a lab that deals with things that are between each other. So, if I have a test variable called age, and I want to know what schooling year that does. Well, how do I do that? So I do that by assuming that I know if I know that I don't go to, I, I don't go to school until um, I'm age four, then I already know the first age to look at. And if I know that if I'm older than four, 
but I'm less than nine, I'm going to go to elementary school. Or if I know that I'm greater than nine or less than 13, I'm going to go to middle school. And if I'm greater than 13 and less than 19, I'm going to go to high school. Otherwise, it's to infinity and beyond. So how do I write this up? How do I tell them, based on someone's age, what school they're going to go to? The way I do that is I use this concept of between, and I use and as my Boolean operator. So you'll see that all of these statements have are, are all checking age. Every single one of them is checking age. And I have my youngest to my oldest. Order is important when you are doing this. Because if you get these out of order, you'll get the wrong answer. And I can show you that in a minute. So if I'm 20, and my age is 20, and I say, okay, age, are you, age is greater than zero. Well, that's true. Age is less than four, that's false. And, which means this statement evaluates to false, and I go to the if statement. Sorry, I go to the LF statement. Well, my age is still 20, so, hey, age, are you greater than or equal to four? True. Age, are you less than nine? False. True and false is still false. And then we do the same thing with 9 and 13, and the same thing with 13 and 19, and then I go to the infinity and beyond. So that's the concept of between. And it is, order is important. You either need to go from largest to smallest, or in this case, I had to go from smallest to largest to get to the else. Okay. So, what time is it? Whoops. Stop. Um, okay. And then we'll go back and we'll do, we'll look at the between. So, we have some complex questions and there's, you will be doing one of the, one of the labs in module three. It's the longest program you will have written so far. And it is a little tricky, and you have to do it in a certain way. So we're going to go over some concepts for it here, and then we're going to go over the pseudocode, because this, starting this week, I'm going to start reviewing pseudocode with you for the labs. So I'm given a number. I just said 223. I want to find the number of 100s and the number of 10s in 223. So... I have to use something called the floor operator. The floor operator is a little different than the modular operator. So you want to make sure you use the floor operator, and the floor is the double slash, backslash. I can never remember which one that is. My apologies. So I have a number. It's 223. I want to know the number of 100s in 223. So to do that, I will have 223, the floor operator 100, and it will give me the number of 100s. Now, I need to figure out the remainder, and this is why modula doesn't work right, because modula doesn't really give us what we want. I'm going to have num equal num minus 100s times 100, which will give me 23 back. And then I'm going to say 10s equal num modula 10. Sorry, num Floor 10, shoot me in the head. So now I have my hundreds and my tens, and I can then go and I can print out what I want. If I don't have any hundreds, then I'll say no hundreds. L if I have 100, I will say number of hundreds is, else there aren't any hundreds. That was stupid. I shouldn't have done it that way. Anyway. So hundreds is equal to zero, true or false. Hundreds is greater than one, true or false. And this one should have been just a hundred is one. So we're going to continue our complex question. 
if 10 is equivalent to 0, then I have no 10s. If 10s is greater than 1, then I have some number of 10s. Otherwise, print 110. So that is, those are our complex questions. So it's, um, it's, it's important to understand how you're doing this and how you get the flow. This is the first time in programming where we really do have to worry about the flow of our code because the flow is going to determine whether or not you get the right or wrong answer. So I think I did that. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to use the flow chart again. And we're just going to look at this from a flowchart perspective real quick. And we will go in and look at some code in just a minute. So I've got the number 223. I'm going to set hundreds is num floor 100. I'm going to set num equal to num minus hundreds. My bad. And then, here, let me do this. That's wrong. I've been using these for years and I just caught that. Okay. So, yeah. So we're going to determine the number of hundreds that we have, and then we're going to determine the number of tens. Now, this doesn't require any decisions. What the decisions are based on is the output. So I'm going to say if I have some, if a hundreds is zero, I'm going to output no hundreds. That's my true. False, which means hundreds is not equal to zero, I'm going to check hundreds greater than one, true or false. If it's true, I'm going to output number of hundreds is and the number. Assuming that if hundreds is not greater than one, then I'm going to print out one. Now, if I had swapped the order, I wouldn't be getting the right, the right answer. And then we go and we look at tens. So the same set of questions. If tens is zero equal true, if it's false, then I go on and I look at, is it greater than one? Otherwise, I output 10 and then I'm done. So you will see how these flow charts get increasingly complex the more questions you have. One of the reasons I went from flow charts to pseudocode when I go over the labs is because I don't have enough space on my slides for some of the flow charts. They're pretty big. Okay. So I'm just going to do a quick one. Hundreds is two. Num is two. Twenty-three tens is two. I think I may have beat this one. So we will... Okay. I'm going to go do a little more code, and then we will go over that oh, floor. Okay, so here's what we just looked at. This is called, this is floor, and I just wrote it so you guys could understand what the floor operator does and looks like. Um, yeah, okay. So let's run this one real quick, and then we'll go for the between uh, edit configuration, floor, where's floor, floor. So let me run this through the debugger. So I have money is 1142 just a number, nothing spectacular. And by the way, I didn't do the user input on these, even though you'll have them in your labs, just because it was, it was expedient, it saved time. So I want to calculate the number of hundreds in money. So I'm going to use the floor operator, and if I go over here on my frames and variables, I go to variables, when I step over this, it will tell me that I have eleven dollars. So eleven, yeah, hundreds. 
And then I'm now going to say my new amount is money equal dollar times 100. So my new amount is 42. And then I'm going to get quarters, hundreds and quarters. This is more like the lab. And then I'm going to just say amount floor quarter. I'm just printing quarters here just because I wanted to, to I must have changed it for one of the previous classes. So dollars greater than zero, true or false? Well, if I go look, dollars is 11, so it is greater than zero. So I want to, and this is important to look at because kind of this is how your labs are going to work. I want to print dollars, and now here I have the, the form of the print function that takes a second argument. So instead of a new line, I want that to be a space. And then now, so I've printed out 11, and now I say, do I want to print the word dollar or dollars? If I print the word dollar, then it's because I only have a single dollar. Otherwise, I'm going to print dollars. So in this case, I'm going to end up printing dollars because I have 11 of them. And then I'm going to go look at quarters. I can see from variables that I have one quarter. So I'm going to print out that quarter. And then I'm going to say if quarters is equivalent to one, and here's where that handy-dandy little uh, mouse over comes in. I only have a single quarter, so I'm going to print quarter, and I'm done. So this is very similar to what the lab will be like. This is not 100% for your lab, but these if-else statements are an indicator of what you would need to do. So, so I have a little bit of a question. Uh, with the floor operator, um, what does that exactly do? Does it basically uh, check the, the amount that's given in the... In uh, print it out for what it is, or how does it actually work? I'm sorry, I first time attending. No, you have nothing to be sorry for, Anthony. That's a good question. Um, it's kind of difficult to say. I I am always used to the modular operator, and I'm always used to it behaving the way I expect it. In Python, the modular operator doesn't doesn't behave the way I would expect it. Okay. So the floor operator will give you a whole number back from the calculation. So it will give you just the whole number part of the division. And right. that's what Modula should do, but Modula doesn't work in this, in this lab. It just doesn't because of how Python's Modula is. So... That's my best explanation. Because I still don't know. I have used Modula in this. I actually wrote it the first time with Modula, and I couldn't get the answers right. And then I went back, and I looked, and it was talking about the floor operator. Now, they do talk about the floor operator a very small amount in Zybooks Module 1. But that is kind of my best explanation. It, it returns the whole number value from that from what's essentially a division. Every other language I've used uses modular for that, but Python's modular doesn't work quite right. Okay, thank you. So that's that's the best one I've got. Sorry. Um, so I'm going to go into. Uh, going over the labs. So, write a program whose inputs are three integers and whose output is the smallest of the three values. This is where we are using that between concept. So, I have a first value, a second value, and a third value. Well, sorry, this is not really between. My apologies. This is not truly a between. I've got three values, and I want to know what one is the smallest. So I have got three variables that I'm going to be checking. And I want to check um, 
I want to check two of the variables at a time. So I'm going to say, is the first value less than or equal to the second value, and the first value less, less than or equal to the third? And if I say that the first value is less than or equal to the second, and the first value is less than or equal to the third, then I know I'm the first value. If I'm not the first value, then I have to do the same thing with the second value, but I have to check it against first, and then I have to check it against third. Otherwise, it's third. So these are a um, multi-branch, mutual, mutually exclusive set of questions. And basically, this is also about using Boolean operators. The AND operator is what you have to use here. And you have two questions. Is first less than or equal to second? Is first less than or equal to third? Put the AND in the middle. If either of those is false, the whole thing is false. L, else if or L if, it, hey, is second less than or equal to first? Is second less than or equal to third? If either of those is false, then the de facto answer is it has to be third. And if any of those is true, it will simply output the number and then it will be done. So this is actually, I apologize, 3.12 is where you're going to use between and 3.12 is the biggest program you will have written. This is just a lot of SL statements and how you do this and the order in which you do this will affect whether or not you get the lab right. So we've got dates, we've got a date, and we've got a month, month and a day. Um, and what we want to do is we want to in output the season for that date. Now, on this, Python's going to do some tricky stuff. It's going to maybe give you a minus 2. Minus 2 is not valid date. So you have to structure this in a way where you can say, hey, this is invalid. And the way you do that is by excluding things. So always check the month first and then the day. Months, and, and it would be really easy if every month fell evenly into a season. This gets a little tricky because that's not the way it is. March, June, September, and December all fall into multiple seasons. So if I look at something like January, I can say, hey, you know, if the month is January and the day is greater than zero and the day is less than or equal to 31, by the way, that's the between, then I know it's winter and I'm done. However, if the month is January and the day is minus 2, I'm going to have false. Now, the nice thing about this structure is you'll see it begins with an if, and there are all these else statements, and there's finally an else at the bottom that says output invalid. So that's why you want to structure it with if and elif statements because if I put in January and minus 2, I want it to fall to the world in, word invalid. And I promise iBooks is going to do something like that. If, however, I've got March, I have to nest my if statement. So you can have an if statement inside of an if statement. In this case, you can have an elif statement, an if statement inside of an elif. So if I look at March, March falls between winter and spring. So if I say, hey, I've got my month is March. Great. It's not January. It's not February. It's March. So I am on the elif month equals March. It's true. So I now go into that block. So in that block, I say, all right, now I've got a date. I've got two between tests. I've got is my day greater than zero and less than or equal to 19? If my day is greater than zero, less than or equal to 19, then it's going to be winter. 
And then it's going to say, okay, well, it wasn't winter. Is it greater than 19 and less than or equal to 31? If that's a true state, and if both of those evaluate to true, then it's spring. Now you'll notice there is an else here. That else invalid is if Zybox puts in March and minus 2. Because you've got the if and the elif are looking for valid dates. The else is saying, sorry, that's an invalid. So this is the way you have to structure lab 3.12. It is a, it's a long lab, but if you follow the pattern, you should be just fine. Okay, this is your, um, this is the one where we're using the floor operator, and we've talked about it a couple of times. But basically what you have to do here is they're going to input a value, and then first, the first thing you're going to do is make sure the, the value isn't less than zero. If it's less than zero, you have no change. Sorry, less than or equal to zero, you have no change. Otherwise, you're now going to do all these calculations using the floor operator and, and making sure that you do the appropriate calculation afterwards. Once you have all of your numbers, then what you have to do is you have to print out either the singular or the plural for the ones that have value. So if there's no dollars, you're not going to print out anything with the word dollar or dollars. You're just going to fall to the next one. And the same with quarters, dimes, nickels, and pennies. And you're going to end up outputting for each of these the value followed by a word. And that word is either the single, singular for that particular amount or the plural for that particular amount. So those are two big um, labs this week. They can be, especially the month one, can be a little bit um, can be a little bit daunting if you're in my class. Please don't hesitate to reach out for help. I check my email in the evening, so if I don't get back to you right away, um, I will usually get back to you that evening. So, does anybody... Oh, there are more. Okay. In pseudocode, can we use the operator instead of the words? No, generally not. Um, Magdalena, there aren't... There aren't the strict rules for pseudocode that there are for things like flowcharts or, or for UML like sequence diagrams and things like that. Um, but generally, I have not seen pseudocode with an operator in it. I see it with the word. Let's say, if it was year, month, date, I'm assuming you'd save, you'd use year first, right? So it's year, month, date. Oh, yes, if it was year, month, date, you'd use year first, but we're not doing year for that one. Oh, um, let me give you the, um, here, I'll put this in, whoops, here. Let me put this in the chat. Oops. Assuming I can, there we go. That's the URL that has the videos for this class and um, the other classes. I've got probably three years' worth of videos up there. Um, in 3.12, I got syntax warning is with a literal. Do you mean equal, equal? I changed it, and I still don't work. I only get the invalid output. Um, Magdalena, I would need to see your code or at least that section. Is there any way you could take a screen capture and post it into the chat? Um, yes, I can. I can post the. Um, okay. The entire code. Yeah, I sent it to my professor two days ago, but I didn't get a reply. I'm wondering if it's a Zybook issue. Okay. Uh, because you're not in my class, I don't have access to your Zybooks. But if you can take a screenshot of it, we can take a quick look 
And um, I can be okay to put a screenshot of it since it's one of the assignments. That would be fine, right? Could you say that a little louder? I'm sorry. I said, is it okay for me to post the entire code since it is one of the assignments for this week? Well, if you could just take a picture of the section that you're getting the error with. I'm getting the syntax error warning for every single line, and I only get the output for the invalid option. Okay. And I did follow um, your recommendation from a prior video. I think it was from the last class. Mm -hmm. where we put all the months in the beginning in a bracket, like in a list. Yeah, you and, can. Um, but it's it's still giving me, I mean, I spent a lot of time on it. And I, I can't figure okay. out how to it to work. Why don't you just take a screen capture and post it here? Okay. Uh, because it's all syntax errors, if somebody tries to copy it, they're just going to end up having all syntax errors. Yep, I'm going to send it right now. Okay. Great. Thank you. No problem. And if anybody else has any questions, let post them here and we can talk about them. Has anybody else um, had the opportunity to try any of the labs this week? Yeah, I actually did lab two, and it took me over 30 minutes to actually get it troubleshooted myself. So Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's a long one. It was a long piece of code. Yeah. I actually ended up having to go to Stack Overflow to figure out what was going wrong in my code myself. Um, I actually had to end up breaking, let me see here if I still have my code. So in that lab, when I was doing the if else if statements, I had to do the um, the input month equals equals March, if not, uh, open parentheses, one uh, greater than or equal to input day, greater than or equal to 31, uh, go to the next line print and valid, uh, else if input day greater than or equal to 19, I'll, uh, go to the next line, print winner. And once I finally started getting that little bit of piece of code down, it actually started to just roll right along. Um, you did it really good in your last slide when I sat there and I looked at that. And I was like, that's just word for word what I just put down. <laughs> One of the things I recommend to students when they're teaching, and I don't think I've mentioned it in this class yet, is the concept of baby steps. A code that you don't, when I try, when I've got large problems to solve, I don't write all of the code and then run it. What I do is something more along the lines of this. Let's just create one while we're waiting. Um, oops. Uh, you. There we go. I'm just going to put a test. So, fine. Um, and it's okay that things don't work right. So, if I, let's say I have got, um, I'm just going to do this so I don't do the input statements. Month is January. And day is um, 22. So I can just test the first piece. I can say if, sorry, I was writing Java there, month equal equal January and, and day less than Sorry, greater than zero and day less than or equal to 31, uh, print winter. Sorry. Now, this may not be everything, but it is something. So if I run this, let's do edit. 
Here we go. If I run this the way, just the way it is, it will come out with winter, what it, which is what I was expecting. However, if I run it with this, it comes out with nothing, which is not what I'm expecting. I'm expecting it to come out with invalid. So what I then have to do is I have to say else print invalid. So I print it, and now it says invalid. So then what do I do? Well, I've got that down. So now let's check February. I'm not going to worry about the leap year. So now let's see what happens. So January should behave the same. I get invalid down there. So what if I put in February? I get invalid. What if I put in February 2nd? I get winter. I now know February works and January works. Well, let's just see if I put in A, B, C, D, E. I should get invalid. I get invalid. So now, then I go to the next month. I say, and by the way, you can do this in PyCharm and then copy it into Zybooks and see if you get any Zybooks errors. That is another way to do this. So I can say, Elif month is March. And I know that March spans two seasons. It spans winter and spring. So I can't remember the exact dates. But I now know that I can say if day is greater than zero. I think it was 19. 19 print center. Else, sorry, L if day greater than 19 and day less than 31. Sorry, I don't know how many days March is. We're just going to put 31. Print spring. And then I'm going to say else. Print invalid. Actually, I'm not going to say else print invalid because then we'll just get it wrong. Then we'll get it wrong and put the right thing in. So now, if I say my month is March, my day is 2, and I run this, I get winter. If I change my day to 30, I get spring. If I change my day to 31, I should get invalid. I don't. Why don't I get invalid? Because it didn't make it to this invalid. Why didn't it make it to that invalid? Well, because this evaluated to true. The minute this evaluates to true, it's as if these, this line doesn't exist to Python. So I have to make sure that I have that invalid case here. And then I get what I'm expecting. So I never write a program in full that's large. I write them small. I write them like this. I write and I test. I write and I test. And I write and I test. Now that's harder to do in Zybooks. You can still do it because you've got to ignore all the rest of the crap and make sure things come out. But it's also something you can do here in PyCharm. You can run it. You can... Have your little test variables, run it, test, run it, test, run it, test. Add crazy things. Add, you know, 99 here. If I add day 99, I better get invalid. I get invalid. So that's building in baby steps. You are programming small, a small amount. You're checking that small amount. Then you add the next, you check the next. And then you go back and you check that, that first thing a little bit too. 
that is how you can actually more easily manage the um, the complexity of the code that you're creating. So Magdalena, were you able to get a screen capture? Um, I did attach a screen capture in the uh, chat. I'm in the chat and I'm not seeing it. I I can see it on my side. Uh, oh, maybe it's my view. No. Can anybody else see the... Ah, there it comes. Okie dokie. There we go. I'll get rid of that. Okay. I to do it in PyCharm, but I, I do not know how to use PyCharm well. And I okay. was stuck, so... Okay, so first of all, you don't need the else, but it's not harming anything here. So, all right, main.py9 missing is literal, do you mean? So, if 9 is, okay, so these should be changed to an equal equal. And, and doing it this way is actually more difficult, but you can if you want. Um, so I changed them to equal, equal, and it still didn't work. Okay. Okay. Then and this is my chart. When we should use is versus equal. I know equal is for equivalent, but then yes. error message confused me um i usually use equal equal i i almost never use is i think you're i think the python is splitting hairs with that and it mostly is about because most things are objects in python it's whether or not the address is the same or if the value is the same so i use equal equal um because well, you have to use equal equal to compare string literals. So, so should I just change all the... All the word is should be changed to equal equal. Okay. Because you can't every, everywhere. Okay? I did that and it, I still couldn't get it to work. Okay. When you did that, did it give you different errors? Uh, it said no output. So it didn't even give me the output for invalid. Okay. That's all right. Um, let's see. If months is not in months and day greater than 31. But it could be less than zero as well. And that would be a compound and with, with a uh, day with an or. So you would have... If month not in months and open parenthesis day less than zero or day greater than thirty one close parenthesis cold is close. it possibly not reaching the print statement when it does that invalid uh, no showing no output um, if if it was really invalid it would potentially if the month was not in months it would potentially not make invalid if they put in January and minus one for the day. This line number six mm -hmm. won't handle that. Okay. Um, I probably said it wrong. My bad. Okay. Oh, what I was trying to say is when she, um, when she said she had the equals equals and everything, and when it came out on her output, uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't reaching the print statement if I'm not mistaken. So basically, was it just like ignoring the the rest of the lines of the code or was would it just get to the one branch, execute it, and then just ignore it? Because it well, didn't output anything. It, it probably didn't output anything because of the nature of the if and else statements that are here. 
because I was experiencing this same problem as well. On one of the co- when when I tried one of the versions of code that I was trying to write, I was getting the same uh, not returning it to the to the console. It was just returning nothing. Okay, which means it didn't ha- it didn't evaluate to true for anything. When I tested it, I put April 11 as the input um, was requested in the lab, uh-huh. and it said no uh, output. Okay. Then so, I put something in right. 65, and it said invalid. Okay. But the strange thing is that invalid comes out as an output underneath all of this syntax warning. Hmm. Um, so you said April 2nd, right? April 11. So if you put in April 11, let's just kind of walk through this. April is in months, so we're good. And the day is not, um, so... Sorry, let me start again. April is in months, so it will not be true on line six. So let's go down to line nine. Um, The month is April, so that means that line nine will evaluate to true. Now, here is why you are not getting the word spring for April 11th. Am I missing Ellis? Nope. Um, What's happening here is that, well, kind of. So if you look at nine, nine is is the branch, nine is the question. 10 and 11 are in the local scope. But technically, 11 is in the local scope of the if statement from 10. So, Nine evaluates to true because it's got April. Ten doesn't because the word April is not in there, and it shouldn't be. So the only way that you would actually see the word spring is if the month were March and the day was greater than 19 or the month was June and the day was less than or equal to 20. April 11th doesn't meet that. So what you would have to do unindent the second if? Well, you can't unindent the second if Mm. because it won't be in the local scope of the if. So you have to restructure it a bit and you have to say, okay, if, um, if the month is April or And then you want to put this in parentheses. This is the other thing you need to do. Or March or month is March and day greater than 19 in parentheses. Or month is June and day less than or equal to 20 in parentheses. Or month is May. And then you'll get a spring. Okay, so it's going to just be one if statement with those parentheses and include the may in that same statement. So you're going to leave nine alone. Okay. Um, Actually, it would be better to do it this way. So leave nine alone. That's fine. What I would say is I would say if month is April or month is May, print spring. And that would go before that would go right after line nine, those two lines. And then line ten would be an L if. Okay. Okay. I also think that you're you might I'm not gonna say anything, but I'm not gonna step on. I think you might ex- also have the same error in line thirteen, sixteen, and yes. nineteen as yes. well. 
absolutely. I was going to mention that she's going to have to reevaluate the That's other one. Fine. That's fine. So then I should keep line nine as it is. Yes. And then for line ten, I should put print spring in line ten. No, no, no. Between line nine and line ten and ten, you want to add an if and a print. So instead of line ten, you would like after line nine, you would you would type another if statement, and the if statement would be if month is April or month is May, because April and May don't have date restrictions. If it's April or if it's May, it's spring. Okay. So I would put an if statement after line nine that basically said if it's April or May and then print spring. Then what is currently line 10 would be line 12 and instead of an if, it would be LF. Okay. So with the LF, do I need to write another print spring? You, you have to write another if statement, another print spring under okay. that if statement in the local okay. scope, and then 910 okay. becomes, instead of an if, it becomes an LF. I got it. I got it. So then I would have to duplicate my um, print spring, my print summer, a print autumn. So I'm doing print spring for the months that do not have restrictions, and then I'm doing an LF for the restriction of the days and providing print spring for both of those. Yes. Okay, great. Perfect. Thank you so much. No problem. This is a good start, and I think it's a very good way to do it. It can be a little more complex, but it is definitely more compact. Thank you. No problem. Does anybody have any more questions? Going once, going twice. Okay, everybody, I hope, I wish you well. I hope you have a very good weekend. If you're in my class, please reach out to me if you have questions. And if not, I will talk to you next week. Thank you very everybody. much. I appreciate it. <laughs> no, not a problem. Have a good evening. Bye. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to stop the recording. Thank you.